Welcome to the Luke Messia Show. The cost of educating illegal aliens in the state of Texas over the last 10 years is more than $50 billion, estimated according to a recent white paper put out by the Huffines Liberty Foundation. Also, the Republican Party of Texas has a new auxiliary, the Young Republicans of Texas. And we're going to tell you as an average Texan why that matters for you. Also, in the aftermath of the Ken Paxton acquittal, you have Dan Patrick and Ken Paxton and many other conservatives going on offense and openly discussing taking media interviews and Dade Phelan really refusing to take any media interviews out of just a fear of not being in a good position to answer any of these questions. Most of his lieutenants are also refusing to comment at all on the impeachment trial. But the ones who have commented have accused pretty much the entire Senate of being corrupt. So we'll continue to bring that to you. Let's get to the show. If I seem a little low energy today, you'll have to bear with me. I am just surviving uh, getting through a pretty violent stomach bug, but decided I really have to record this anyway. So made a trip to Austin getting this recorded and then I will return home. I actually do like getting a good stomach bug once or twice a year is kind of my goal. Ideally during Lent, because during Lent I don't I go off sugar. And so if I can get a stomach bug and no sugar kind of lined up together, I mean, it keeps my health in um, in a pristine window. With that being said, there's a couple things I want to break down for you today. And one of those is the fact that the Huffines Liberty Foundation just released a white paper, which you can read at HuffinesLiberty.com, talking about the cost of educating illegals who are crossing our border. And they're estimating it well over $6.6 billion this year. And that is an insanely high number. Just to tell you, could it kind of put in perspective, the Texas House and Senate only delivered less than $13 billion of new property tax relief this year. And they came back to you, the taxpayers, and said, hey, we have given you monumental, historic, incredible, amazing property tax relief. And literally that same amount of money over the next two years is going to get spent on educating illegals. In fact, more money will be spent on educating illegals, according to this estimate, than will be given to you in the form of new property tax relief this session. So if that frustrates you, it should. Now, one of the good things um, that I'm excited about is the fact that the Huffines Liberty Foundation and Texans for Strong Borders are kind of two organizations that really didn't exist two years ago. And they are leading and bringing out way more information than Texans have ever had on the issue of illegal immigration and border security. Uh, Rewind two years ago, we didn't have one single group that was solely dedicated to immigration policy in the state of Texas. And now we see Texans for Strong Borders and Huffines Liberty Foundation being two very legitimate statewide organizations. So if you're not familiar with both of those organizations, look them up and engage with them because they are leading the charge on the issue of immigration, not just eliminating the magnets, which Texas can do on its own, but also actually securing the border, which we have to do, whether we want to or not. Our state sovereignty is at stake, and it's time to shut it down. Also, this weekend, the Republican Party of Texas during its quarterly SREC meeting, and for those of you who don't know how this works, our Republican Party is governed by the State Republican Executive Committee. It's essentially the board of directors of the party and then led by the chairman. He's the one who executes things. He uh, leads in most areas, but the SREC has kind of this governing, guiding role that they also play. And so many of our friends are on the SREC. There's a man and a woman for each state Senate district. So during their quarterly board meeting, they recognized the Young Republicans of Texas as a new auxiliary. Now, why is this important? So the Texas Young Republican Federation recently came out with a statement that said that they had no desire to work with the Republican Party of Texas until Matt Rinaldi was no longer chairman. Now, if that sounds like a bit of a dramatic position. It is. Um, I haven't seen this happen. I haven't seen statewide organizations do this with past chairmen. I haven't seen conservative statewide organizations or more moderate statewide organizations, which is uh, what is kind of reflected with the Texas Young Republican Federation membership. But the truth is, I I haven't seen this done. Um, It was hyperbolic. It was dramatic. And it wasn't received well by Texans who were actually excited that the Republican Party of Texas has been 
more aggressive. I've, I've said this, it, we have more conservative leadership and a more conservative SREC and more conservative grassroots delegates than I think at any time in Texas history. It's one of the reasons Dade Phelan actually moved to impeach Ken Paxton is because they're trying to stranglehold the conservative movement. They're trying to push down all the momentum that we're seeing across the state of Texas. And not only did the Texas Young Republican Federation come out and say, hey, we don't have any desire to be part of the Republican Party of Texas anymore. An auxiliary status simply says that you as an organization are working in cooperation with the party. Okay, so you can be a conservative organization out there doing anything and everything. But what, granted, auxiliary status, it means I'm trying to work with the party to build the party. And Texas Young Republican Federation basically said, we don't want to do that with the party until we have more moderate leadership, I guess. So interestingly enough, following that, the Texas Young Republican Federation also took a pro-Paxton impeachment stance. And uh, when Paxton was acquitted, they put out this kind of strange statement that said, we acknowledge the Senate's, respectfully acknowledge the Senate's decision to acquit. They didn't, I was, it's just this long statement that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So they didn't say they agreed with it. They didn't say they disagreed with it. They just respectfully acknowledged the decision. So then you come into this quarterly meeting and the Young Republicans of Texas anchored by two very large young Republican groups in Dallas County and Rockwall County. And these two groups are not only seen as the largest chapters of young Republican groups in the state of Texas, but they were also two groups that were removed from the Texas Young Republican Federation membership. And, um, and so these are conservative clubs that basically banded together and said, hey, why don't we just create our own group, the Texas Young Republicans, and we'll go join with the Republican Party of Texas. And here's what's so funny. The Texas Young Republican Federation actually went down to Corpus Christi where the quarterly meeting was being held and lobbied SREC members to not let the Young Republicans of Texas in. Okay, so this group said, we don't want to be part of the Republican Party of Texas at all. We have no desire to work with y'all. We're ending our relationship, okay? Imagine like a girlfriend that says, I'm breaking up with you. I don't ever want to see you again. And then the second you're like, hey, I'm actually going to go on a date with somebody else, they come down and they're like, don't you dare go on a date with that person. That's basically the Texas Young Republican Federation. So they go down there and they lobby hard and they ask the SREC to please, 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 please do not recognize this group. Because not only do they want to tear down the Republican Party of Texas as an institution, not only do they want to tear down, you know, the conservative movement that is growing substantially, not only in the party, but across the state. Now they've decided they don't actually want any other young Republican group to exist. Needless to say, the SREC did not heed their requests and it recognized this organization, Young Republicans of Texas. I went to my first Republican state convention when I was 16 years old. So I've been going to, I guess I've been part of the Republican Party of Texas for more than half of my life. And as an institution, I have seen it and I have worked to take it a little further to the right consistently every year, every other year, every election. And I think what we have now is one of the most conservative Republican parties we've had in recent history, definitely the most conservative Republican party we've had in recent history. And so these outside establishment forces are going to work very hard to tear that down. And you saw that with the Texas Young Republican Federation leaving, and then there were articles written that said, oh, the, the, there's fallout because of Matt Rinaldi and because of conservatives in the party. So they were trying to seed these little doubts. Maybe when conservatives take over, coalitions can't be built. It's a silly attack, but it was an attempt and a valiant one at that. So then what happens is we realize, no, we don't need the Texas Young Republican Federation. We'll be fine with the Young Republicans of Texas. And they're going to start new chapters and grow local chapters. And they're going to do what auxiliaries should be doing, which is be in the business of building the party, of organizing more people, of putting boots on the ground together and getting those people to then go out and try to advance the conservative ideas we have. The Texas Young Republican Federation got caught up in becoming part of this attempt to attack the institution of the Republican Party of Texas, and so far it has not gone well for them. And I don't think it will continue to go well. At any point, they could change course. 
And that's actually a good segue into Dade Phelan. But it's kind of important to recognize the fact that when people push back, when people make mistakes, it's not that hard to just acknowledge, hey, I did the wrong thing. Hey, I overstepped. Hey, I got over my skis in this way. So hopefully that's what we can see with young Republicans across Texas. And people can start coming together because they started this silly fight, which then culminated in the formation of a new organization. Now, for you as an average Texan, the reason this matters is because it shows that the Republican Party of Texas is an institution that is set and focused on growing for the sake of advancing conservative ideas in the state. And these little hiccups that were attempted by outside establishment forces are not succeeding. That's what you should be appreciative of. Now, we're going to segue into Dade Phelan, who could, by the way, also at any point admit he did the wrong thing. Now, here's what's interesting. Dan Patrick, even since my last episode, has probably done five or six media interviews. He's done half a dozen radio interviews. I thought about playing some clips for y'all today, but there's too many. So just go to Dan Patrick's Twitter and listen to the radio interviews he's done, watch the TV interviews he's done. He actually just released a behind the scenes kind of documentary um, about kind of how the process worked. And they interviewed three different senators, Paul Betancourt, Brandon Creighton, Pete Flores. So that's something I would definitely recommend that you take a look at, watch, consume. The most important thing, though, is that following that, you also had Tucker Carlson uh, go on, uh, interview Ken Paxton. And, and Ken went on Tucker and had a long sit down where they just went completely after the entire uniparty system in the Texas House of Representatives. Dade Phelan and all of his moderate lieutenants who work with Democrats to run the lower chamber. So while the forces that the conservative forces in Texas are on offense, they're out there and they're talking and they're not afraid to talk, Dade Phelan and his team are largely staying quiet. Dade Phelan wrote one op-ed in the Beaumont Enterprise, which is his local newspaper. And the approach that Dade and Andrew Murr and Jeff Leach and several of these Republicans who are speaking out publicly is basically, we're against corruption and the Senate is for corruption. It's a really lazy argument. It lacks the ability to even acknowledge the fact that their case completely fell apart. They act as though they gave a mountain of evidence, even though Democrat commentators out there are even saying that the evidence simply wasn't given. The problem is that they're setting their chamber on a course to continue to point fingers at the Senate as this rigged, corrupt chamber. And that's a fight that they seem to want to pick, kind of like the Texas Young Republican Federation. You're just going out, calling names, pointing fingers. So what you're seeing is that most of Dade's Lieutenants are not joining him and Murr and Leach. Instead, they're kind of staying quiet. They haven't said anything about it. They're not commenting at all. No one's doing TV interviews. No one's doing radio interviews. This shows that the impeachment was too far of a stretch. It kind of reveals that every one of these legislators know that it's indefensible. What they're hoping is that it just goes away. This is what they want. They want it to just all go away. They want three months from now for all of you to just say, well, you just tried to unelect our attorney general. No harm, no foul. Let's see what happens next session. Please don't try to impeach again, even though none of you will say that you don't support impeachment in the future. It's not a hard request to just tell these lawmakers, even if you did vote to impeach, it's not hard to come out and say, hey, knowing the information I know today, I wouldn't vote to impeach. I think that's a reasonable position to take, and I hope to see lawmakers take it. We'll have to see if anyone has an ounce of humility in that respect. Do you wanna get paid to make a difference? Gen Z is now in Congress, and if you're between the ages of 18 and 25, you may not necessarily want to be in Congress, but if you still wanna fight for the future, we have the opportunity for you. Texas Scorecard is Texans' leading news source for citizens, and we're looking for young fighters to join our fellowship program. Texas Scorecard offers a paid internship for spring, summer, and fall semesters, allowing participants to get their feet wet in the media business. Fellows can apply for one of three tracks, writing, research, and administration. Think you have what it takes? Fellows often leave the program with the opportunity to continue the work full time. In closing, I want to talk about 
a Washington Post article about the DEI bill and its effects at Texas A&M University. I've talked about the DEI bill. Many of you have been following this policy. The interesting thing is that the Washington Post just published an article talking about how the DEI bill's implementation is causing stress at Texas A&M University. This is, uh, <laughs> I'll read a couple of these little excerpts. The July email to Texas A&M University instructors caught many by surprise. The university would drop a required lesson on respect and inclusion from a semester-long program open to all first-year students. According to the email, this was necessary, an official wrote, in light of a new state law that bans, in part, mandatory diversity training. In its place, a and would add a lesson on mental health. Just worth saying, that's probably going to be a bad lesson, too. So the respect and inclusion, bad class, good we're getting rid of it. Mental health class, probably a bad class, too. The email from the university's first year experience office was met with faculty pushback within hours AM and walked back its directive. A vice provost called it premature as officials sought more legal guidance about the law. Weeks later, a and sent another message confirming that after all, the university would nix the lesson as a requirement for the curriculum. Confusion over the fate of a single lesson reflects broad anxiety among many faculty and students about what the new Texas law banning activities related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, commonly abbreviated as DEI, will mean for what is taught, who is hired, and how universities support students. The closure of campus DEI offices in the state, a central feature of the measure, is already underway. At least one school has also shuttered its LGBTQ Resource Center. And if you're wondering which school that is, that's the University of Houston actually announced that they're shutting down their LGBTQ Resource Center. And I hope the next session we're able to pass a bill that says there should be no LGBTQ Resource Center on any state university in Texas. And despite assurance that the restrictions won't infringe on the classroom, some faculty say they remain concerned about what may be on the horizon. Those fears are particularly acute at AM where the hiring of a new journalism director went off the rails this summer amid political concerns about her post-work on diversity issues. Now, what does that mean? Ultimately, it means that they're really concerned that this is going to make it harder for them to tell students about Marxist ideas. And that is the design of the policy. And they even point to actually something the Texas scorecard was right in the middle of, where they were going to hire a new a dean of their journalism school who is an avowed Marxist. And when Texas scorecard wrote about that, and courageously wrote about it, it caused all sorts of problems, and they ultimately decided not to hire her. And then they wrote her a million-dollar check as an I'm sorry for not hiring you decision. This is good news, ultimately, for what's happening. Um, it's good news for the, the kind of re realizing that the DEI bill is actually having a positive effect on the system, that it's actually leading to the necessary reforms that we wanted to see. It's not going far enough. And what I mean by that is that this entire story is filled with faculty Senate members and deans and provosts and whatever, all basically decrying the DEI bill, complaining about it. I want to actually focus on Mark Welsh for a second. He is actually the interim president at Texas A&M University. He's a retired four-star Air Force general who was recently the dean of the university's Bush School of Government. Here's what he says. He says, by now, Welsh is used to questions that he says he can't answer. Chief among them is how the university will operate under the state's new DEI restrictions. That's strange. You're a four-star general. You don't know how to just say, well, it's going to shut down all these programs that people don't like and that are not healthy for our students. This is not where we want to go. Welsh has the same, this is back to the story, Welsh has the same unsatisfying response. He is waiting. He is awaiting legal guidance. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means they don't want to do it. They're literally trying to ask the lawyers, can you tell us how much DEI we can still have on our university? Because it wouldn't be hard to say, is that DEI? Yeah, don't do it. Really easy. But the reason they need legal guidance is because the new interim president at Texas A&M University needs to know just how much can I finagle some DEI 
in every nook and cranny of the university. While Welsh, back to the Washington Post article, while Welsh said he would not have supported SB 17, quote, I don't believe it's beneficial to where we are trying to go long range as a society. He said that a lot of what the university does to promote diversity won't change. A&M should not trump should not have, have no trouble complying with the law's prohibition of racial preferences in hiring or promotion, he said, and the law exempts recruitment so universities can still market themselves to underrepresented minorities and first-generation students. Quote, I think the law was intended to just make sure that no particular group got to benefit, got the benefit of the doubt or preferential treatment from any other group, Walsh said. And we can do that. That just kind of makes common sense anyways. So this is the new president saying, hey, I don't think SB 17 was very helpful. I think it's going against the long-term place we want to take our society. This guy should not be in charge of any university in the state of Texas. If you are leading a university in the state of Texas and you've decided that what's best for the long-term trajectory of society is more Marxism, then you're not fit to lead students in the state of Texas. This is crazy, but this is what we're up against. So the good news that comes out of this Washington Post article is that many centers are closing and the DEI bill is having a massive effect. Understand though, that our higher education institutions are filled with leftist Marxists who are going to use every little nook and cranny, every little exception they can find to keep as much Marxism on their universities as possible. And that is why we're going to have to pass the CRT ban that the Texas House killed last session, that the Senate passed. It's why we're going to have to pass additional DEI legislation once we see all the little ways that administrations are working around it. I look forward to continuing for that fight, and I'm sure many of you will too. And we have a Senate that is definitely focused on this and a House that can be pushed around, has shown their ability to be pushed around on this issue as well. Thank you so much for those of you who continue to follow what we're doing and what we're putting out. Um, I hope that you've learned a lot and I hope that you stay engaged. May God bless you and may God bless the great state of Texas. No ads, no paywalls, no government grants, and no corporate masters. Just real news for real Texans. This is Texas Scorecard.